what helped us to end the war and we dropped the bombs on, on Japan. We know the story. But Oppenheimer, he makes a statement. He, he was, uh, everybody was praising them for this, they, they, the miracle that took place when they were able to uh, come up with the nuclear bomb, the atomic bomb, and, and, and save millions of lives. They looked for Robert Oppenheimer after this, after the dust had settled and he went back to a normal life. But they said he withdrew from society. He had no more purpose in his life. He had no more, no more drive. And so right before he died, Robert Oppenheimer, who pretty much, uh, I believe, is responsible for America being what it is today, a land of democracy and a republic, he makes this statement, which is very sad. He says... After, it all, after the bomb was made, I lost all uh, purpose. I now find myself in my room. I am now the loneliest man in the world. He said, I have no purpose. Taking it easy. Challenge is removed. Adventure. When the consequences are, life becomes unsatisfying. You know what? This is also... A dangerous way to live. We found a very interesting article, and I'm not going to read it too much. It's an article called Dirt is Good uh, from Rob Knight and Sandra Blacasley. Bla Bla anyway, I can't remember her name. They write this article, and they're talking about how kids nowadays, there are more allergies in the air than have ever been in, in the history of, of America. Kids are allergic to everything. Kids are getting sick. All these problems. And you know what they attribute it to? They attribute it to that we become too clean of a society. People are always afraid to get dirty. Germaphobes. Some of you say, yep, as you put on this, the sanitizer right now. We have sanitizer on both sides of the church. Germaphobes. They say, you know what, the best thing we could do for our kids, this, this is doctors, let them play in the dirt once in a while. No, Pastor! Ask, ask Raymond and, and Ramiro. I could we used to play in the dirt when we were kids, huh? Climb trees. All kinds of crazy stuff. We used, I, and, and, and we're afraid to let our kids get dirty. They're afraid, germophobia. And it's become a very dangerous, it's caused problems in our society. Everyone's getting antibiotics. Shooting up our bodies with antibiotics every time you get sick. It's dangerous to live a life without ever having to trust God. These men were at a point where they were having to choose where they were going to end up in life, their future. When you're afraid to take a challenge, when you're afraid to do what's necessary, you know what? This becomes very dangerous. It opens you up to all kinds of crazy things. Listen to me. I'm not going to go, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read the scripture, but we, how many know the story of King David? What happened to King David? He had committed adultery. But you know what's interesting, and I have a whole other sermon on this. Where did his problems start? King David was supposed to be at war. All the other kings were fighting. No, that's too dangerous. It's more comfortable here in the, the palace. I got other things to do. I'm going to let them. He was supposed to be fighting. And what happens? All of a sudden, it's in the security and safety of, of, of a, being in a place where he shouldn't have been. All of a sudden, temptation comes his way. But Sheba's there waiting. All of a sudden, he gives in to a temptation. When you and I are not doing and living the life we're supposed to live, when you and I are not being the Christians we're supposed to be, men, when you're not being the men you're supposed to be, women, if you're not being the women you're supposed to be, and you're kicking back, and you're not taking risks, and you're not trusting God, you're, you're opening yourself up to all kinds of craziness. You know what also happens, the other consequence is we lose impact. You know what the truth is? 
we as people, nobody here is ever inspired by people that play it safe. Think about our heroes, the heroes in life. Let's, let's just think about them. Who are all the, the Michael Jordans, the Kobe Bryants, the Tom Brady's, Steve Jobs, every famous person that's ever lived. Think about your hero in life. And this, I'm not talking about Batman and Superman. <laughs> well, they take risks too, but that's... <laughs> well, what kind of a hero would Superman be if he never did anything? Or Batman? But think, think about the people that inspire us. None of us are ever inspired by those who play it safe. I began to think about this. I don't know about you, but I want to be an inspiration to our kids. Our teenagers. Are we living a life that's inspirational to them as Christians? I'm not, t listen, I understand hard work. That goes without saying. We teach them that. Every parent here, you're, hopefully you're teaching your kids that hard work is important. I understand that. But I'm talking about living for God. Risking it all. Do our kids see us live as, a, as, a, as people that are dependent on God financially? Do your kids see you financially trust God? Do your kids ever see you take a step of faith and say, we're going to believe God for this? Do our kids see us make sacrifices of our time? Well, yeah, I make sacrifices for my family. What about for God? Like I said, I was thinking about this this weekend. I, you know, we live two hours from Disneyland. We, people go to Disneyland every once in a while, two or three times a year. We can't even go see Pastor Mitchell preach. But we can go to see Mickey Mouse. How messed up is that? We can go to the beach. Oh, you guys are going to, to, the, to, the, to the, the Pioneer Rally? Yes, we have a weekend off. I'm going to stay home and chill. Where's the risk? Where's the sacrifice? What are we teaching our kids? Do our kids want to be like us? Do our kids want to aspire to be Christians like us? It's dangerous if we stop taking risks. It's dangerous if we don't live as men and women of faith. No one is ever inspired by a man or woman who is always playing it safe. You know, you think about, I, I mentioned David. This was one of the, the differences between David and Saul. Why did the people of God get inspired by David? Because he was a young man willing to fight a giant. What was Saul doing? You know, Saul was the tallest man. The biggest man in his kingdom, the Bible says. Head and shoulders above everybody. He should have went to go fight Goliath. But he was afraid. He didn't want to trust God. But it was David. This young man. The people inspi were inspired by David. Saul has killed his thousands. David his ten thousands. That's the difference. Men or women of inspiration. That's what we need to be. It's dangerous when we don't live a life that, are, that we're called to live as brothers, as, as men and women of God. It's destructive to others in their future. Ezekiel 22, verse 30, I looked for someone who might re rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. These words always come to my mind. I searched for someone to stand in the gap so I wouldn't have to destroy the land, but I found no one. Brother, sister, if we're not being the people we're supposed to be, it's dangerous. It affects a lot. The future. I've come to the conclusion that this, this is something that we're going to have to do. If we're going to see this valley saved... If we're going to see our children make it, we all, I've been preaching a lot about this. We want to see our kids saved and, and inheriting the blessings of God. We have to live this. This is the life we're called to live. 
If you're going to see God move in your life, you're looking for deliverance, you're looking for dominion, you're looking for God to move, you're going to have to take some risks. You're going to have to step out in faith. You need to put yourself in a position, God, I need you to move in this area of my life. Let's look finally this morning at the heart that conquers. So we have to take a risk. Everything about salvation, everything about the life of a Christian should be about risk. It should be about taking chances, making decisions where we are not sure about the, an- the outcome. But pastor, if I give sacrificially, what's going to happen? I don't know. <laughs> Well, come on, I want the blessing. I want the blessing too, but how many know sometimes it just doesn't happen that way? (laughs) There have been times where I give and sometimes it gets a little worse. (laughs) Oh, but if I step out in faith in ministry, what happens if it fails? Well, I I can't. How many know there's no guarantees? But we cannot let that stop us. Just because we're not sure of the outcome. The very foundation of Christianity. We know the story, Genesis 12, 1. Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family, from your father's house to a land that I will show you. you you're probably saying, Pastor, you use that scripture every week because that scripture, I've been thinking about it a lot. The very, the very foundation of living for God, it's about trusting God. We don't know the outcome, but God does. And God's promise has always come to pass. There are people here, some of you have received words from evangelists and pastors. Some of you, God has given you a promise. You've read something in scripture, you've heard a sermon, you've heard something, somebody say something, or you've seen something, you say, you know what, I want that for my life, that's what I want. God's given you that. He wants to give that to you. But you have to have the right, you have to say, God, I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to step out in faith. I'm going to give of my time. I'm going to sacrifice personally. I'm going to do what I need to do. God purposely designed salvation so that we would purposely have to depend on him. You know, God wants you to put yourself in situations that you, where you need him. But that, that's the problem in life. We, we, we don't want to live that kind of a life. Live comfortably, no financial problems. I have everything going good. My family is happy. Life is good. Life is easy. That's the life we want. God says, no, when are you going to trust me? Put yourself in a position to trust me. Step out in faith. Pastor Cox made a statement yesterday morning. He said there was a time in his church where they were lacking finances. That was the problem. They couldn't, They didn't have the finances to send men out. He says, now the problem I have, because now God's given us finances, but now no one wants to go out. They have good jobs. They bought their home, two or three cars. They have everything they've ever wanted. Now they don't want to go out. God is dividing the land. Promises an inheritance. Luke 5, verse 4. When Jesus had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. You know, this command is still there for you and I. We need to get away from the shore and launch out into the deep. Launch out into the deep. But it's deep. What's out there? I don't know. We want to stay by the shore, huh? Play, play. Oh, that's right here. My kids, they like to sit in the pool and put their feet in the water. Get in the water. Get into the deep. But pastor, what's in there? I don't know. But God says he wants you to take some risk. 
He wants you to trust. He wants you to step out in faith. He wants, you know, pastor, I'm just waiting for the Lord. You're waiting, W-A-D-I-N-G. You're not waiting. You're waiting in the shallow water. He says, get into the deep water. Put yourself in a position. Brother and sister, we have a church of almost 130, 150 people. We should be doing so much more. Oh, Pastor, that's for someone else. If I worry and I, I, I... It's not for someone else. It's for you. Think about the people of God. They all have the promised land for them. Their lack of heart derailed them. God's plan still came to, pla came to pass, but they missed out. God wants you and I to launch off. Trust God for a miracle. Take the necessary steps. Finances, ministry, your time. Get out of the comfort zone. Caleb's spirit, verse 12. Now therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. Can you say, God, I want what you've promised me. God, I want it. Give me this mountain. My marriage, my family, God, my future. Give me this mountain, God. I want it. Ah, I don't want it. I just, I'll settle for a little heel. That's the wrong heart. There's consequences. Even though I don't see how it's going to happen, God, I want this mountain. God, I'm going to trust you. Go and do what I need to do. I love this scripture, Psalms 107, 23 through 24. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. Are there things in your life that God is dealing with you about? Are there things in your life that you would really like to see happen? Are there areas where you know that you're going to have to take a risk, step out in faith? You know, this is the spirit of our fellowship. That's the spirit of our mother church. That should be the spirit of our church. Let's step out. Let's do what we need to do. There's no other way. Finances, new converts. How many know new converts take work? <laughs> Don't be so loud, brother. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been praying. I, and I was talking to one of the other brothers recently. God, I want to hold on to our fruit. It's good to see people come in the church, isn't it? Family members, friends, loved ones. God, I want them to stay. To serve you. What do we have to do? We need to take care of them. Oh, six months, one year. Well, are we limiting God now? I understand there's got to be revelation. I understand people have to get it. But Pastor Mitchell, you missed out on a, a classic sermon. Pastor Mitchell preached on that. He said, you know what? Not everyone's the same. I was like, Pastor Mitchell, what? What, what about six months? A year? He said, not everyone's the same. So that means we got work to do. <laughs> New converts are hard. Visitors, it's hard to, to, to spend time, to give up of your precious time to pick up someone for church. To see how, to go pray for someone in the hospital. To witness There's no other way. It's not easy to make a stand in your, with your family. 
It's not easy to make a stand at work. It's not easy to make changes in your life. But God, I want this mountain. Give me this mountain. You know, the reality is, if God doesn't help us, the mountain's going to crush us. <laughs> but that's what he wants. God, if you don't help me, I'm sunk. God will help. God will get involved. We'll see God move. This has to take part in our heart. Verse 9, as I close, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. Are you wholeheartedly living for God? That's the key. Wholeheartedly, when you actually research that word, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, what the word is, it actually comes from a word that hunters used to use. It's a word that's used to describe they close the gap between the hunter and the prey. I In other words, nothing's going to separate me from my goal, from what I'm supposed to be doing. Think about it. Caleb is 85 years old. 45 years later, God is preparing to move. And Caleb says, you know what, God? There's no distance between my heart and your will. Brother, sister, how much distance is between your heart and God's will for your life? We should be holy. That's the key. I'm holy following you, God, wholeheartedly. Priority. Caleb says, I still want what God wants. 35 years later, my prayer, my question, my desire has been, God, I want us to still want what you want 35 years later. Can we say that? Psalms 123, 2, Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the, land, uh, look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. This is a picture of a servant who's waiting for the slightest opportunity to please his master. This should be our focus. God, what do you want me to do? Anything you want, God. Instead of trying to calculate everything. God, I'm going to trust you. God, I want what you want for my life. We need to want the will of God. We all, wrote, wrote, you all raised your hands earlier. I want God's plan. I want God's will for my life. I want God's blessing. We should still want it, even though it's going to take some risk. Time, age, disappointment, failure, people, fear, none of this should stop us from moving forward. The Bible reminds us that it's always too soon to quit. From Noah to Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, David, all the way to Jesus. The Bible is a story about people who won the fight simply because they refused to throw in the towel. Don't pull back. Don't take the easy route. There's consequences. But the other side is true. When we step out, God always comes through. And I close with this story. Roger Wilhelm was a mountaineer's guide in Switzerland. Whenever people wanted to climb the Alps, they would ask him to guide them because he was a sure foot, hand and eye. He knew his way around the mountains. He spent his whole life guiding, climbing, to the top of the mountains, then guiding them along more difficult downward trails. One night, word came to Wilhelm that a party of climbers had begun the ascent without a guide and were lost in a blizzard which had come up without warning. Without losing a moment, Wilhelm went out to search for them. That was the last time poor Wilhelm was seen. When the storm was over, they found him on the slippery, treacherous mountain slope in the blinding blizzard. He had slipped and fallen into a cleft in the rocks. They buried him there on the mountainside that he had loved so much. The people of the village at the foot of the mountain were so proud of him that they wanted to put a tombstone over his head. 
There was a long discussion about what words they would carve into his stone. After much argument, they decided on these words. He died as he had lived, climbing. You and I should always be climbing. Don't go backwards. Let's see God move. Let's see the blessing of God. I'm looking forward to the day. You know, because we're going to need help when we go into our new building. Pastor, where's our new building? I don't know yet. <laughs> we got one coming. We're going to need help when we send out our ch another church overseas. Where to? I don't know yet. But we're going to need help. Let's do what we're called to do. And you know what? God's blessing will come through and it won't be just for us, but all those, all these little ones will be blessed as well. New converts. This valley. Give me this mountain. Amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed this morning. Thank you. Joshua chapter 14. I'm not sure if you guys know the name Ron Wayne, Ronald Wayne. If you're familiar with uh, the Apple story, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak. Some of you maybe have read the book. Ron Wayne is the third unknown partner that actually helped in the beginning start Apple Corporation. He was, uh, he was a little bit older at the time, but Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, they didn't have enough money, so they were able to convince Ron Wayne to put up about $10,000 of his own money. So the company started to grow really fast, and this guy, Ron Wayne, he had already had other, made other business decisions in the past, and as Apple Corp was getting ready to uh, make a big splash. There was rumors of it going, going public. It was a huge, huge deal coming up with the Apple Corporation. This guy, uh, Ron Wayne, he got cold feet. And so he called Steve Jobs. He set up a meeting. This man, at the time, he had invested $10,000, which gave him 10% of Apple's stock corporation and Apple's uh, uh, ownership. He owned 10% of Apple. He got, he got cold feet. He was afraid that the company was going to fail. And so what he did is he called his other two partners. He says, you guys, I want out. I, I don't think this is going to work out. I'm afraid to lose money. I'm, he had the most money invested at the time. And so he sold all of his shares of Apple Corporation for $800. Today, 10% stock 10% of, of ownership of Apple Corporation, he'd be worth $80 billion. That kind of a fortune, he would be in the, one of the richest men in the world. Instead, today, he lives in Nevada, playing the penny machines, living off his Social Security. He was quoted as saying, I still don't regret my decision. I made the best decision at the time. He says, my stomach wasn't ready for such a ride. Now, he can say what he wants, but how many would agree that was a bad, bad move? <laughs> but when you read a story like that, especially in this case, here is a man who ended up in a very different place in life than Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. How many know that? They're living two different lives right now. He ended up in a very different place, and all because... His attitude about risk. He didn't have the stomach. He was not willing to take a risk and step out. In the story we're going to read, we read, we read this, we, we know the story very well, the story of Joshua and Caleb. This is after the people of God have disobeyed God. This is, they're at the point where God is about to bring blessing. And Caleb, in our story, he's... He's different than his brethren. He makes a statement in the text we're going to read. He says, give me this mountain. And so as, you, as we read the story and as you listen to that statement, this statement reveals to you and I the spirit that you and I are going to have, the, the, the spirit we need to have if we want to see God move in our life. Now, 
Before I get going this morning, how many want to see God move in their life? You really want God to see, I'm not just talking about, you know, feel good. How many want to see God move in their life? Well, this is critical this morning. Sermon I've entitled, Give Me This Mountain, Joshua chapter 14, beginning in verse 6. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephthah, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know the, word, you know the word which the Lord spoke to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85 years old. As yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both, both for going out and for coming in. Now therefore... Give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to, Cal and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephthah, as an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephthah, the Canaanite, to this day because he wholly Follow the Lord God of Israel. Amen. Let's pray this morning. God, I'm asking you to help me. God, help us to put aside all the stuff, all the distractions of life. Leave them outside, God, so that you can minister to us this morning. I pray, God, for your anointing. God, speak to us. Challenge us. I come against the spirit of pride. I come against self-righteousness and, and religious mindsets. God, help us. God, as you prepare to divide the land to bring blessing, God, your promises to our lives, to this church. God, help us to embrace who you've called us to be. Have your way in this service, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to first... Look at choosing your future because it's obvious in our text throughout the Bible and we can all agree. How many would, would, would agree with me? God has a purpose. There's purposes for God. In our story, God has a plan and a purpose. This is something all of us need to understand that there are things that God wants to happen. Even for you and I in this church, there are things that God desires to happen. They're in His plan. He has things that he wants to take place. Verse 6, you know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. And so we know the story, we know all the background. But one of the things that you, have, you cannot ignore is that even though God had his plan, God had things he wanted done, still Joshua and Caleb Man had a personal part to play. If you are looking at this story, they're at a point, they're at a time where God is about to divide the land. He's about to give them the land that He promised. It's the blessing. It's an inheritance. And God brings them to this point. You know the story, Joshua and Caleb, where they were the only two of the 12 spies that actually brought, brought back a good report, had faith in God. And God says, okay, you know what, Joshua and Caleb, you're going to get the promised land. All these other people, the whole generation, you're not going to get it. You're going to wander in the wilderness. So we know that story. But here we see, so now it's 45 years later. Caleb's 85 years old. God is bringing to pass 
His promise. God is, God's will is being played out. And so something that you and I have to ask ourselves, something I ask myself constantly, God, where, what is my part in your plan? God, where do I fit in? God has a plan. God has promises. He has desires, things that He has set in motion. You've been saved any length of time. You understand God's plan, God's will. It has factors that are important. It has, how many know location is important? God's plan, God's will has an address. Timing is important. Function is important. Joshua and Caleb, all these people, they had different functions. In our text, verse 12, he says, Now give me this mountain. And so all these factors are at work. There's time, location, function. And so when you, when you take this into account, you and I can relate because this is kind of what happens when we come to church. You know, when we come to church, God is dividing the land. He's, he's putting us in our place. He's bringing us to a point. Salvation takes place. Blessing takes place. Deliverance takes place. Most of you that are here, if not maybe all of you, are at a very critical time. There's decisions that are being made every time we come to church. Every time we hear a sermon. Every time there's an offering plate being passed. There's decisions that are being made. God is dividing out the land. There's issues of dominion. All of this is part of what happens when we come to church. And all of this factors into the will of God. You think about our church. God has a plan for this congregation. Now the other thing you cannot ignore, and this is something that's played out over and over in Scripture, even though God has a plan, the Bible is very clear that you and I can hinder that plan. Now understand, how many know we can't stop God's plan? We can't stop God's plan. He's going to do what He's going to do with or without us. But the Bible is very clear. We can hinder it. Bible tells us, verse 10 tells us, 45 years had gone by because of their bad decisions. They, they, they were at a critical time when they were getting ready to take the land. Their heart is revealed. We come to church. We hear a sermon. God is moving. How many know our heart is revealed? The conversations we have with ourselves. The, the critic, the, those that are critical of the sermon or the words. You come to, you, in your mind, you have your own uh, argument about what's being preached sometimes. And, and our heart is being revealed. And in our story, you know what's interesting? It wasn't, you know, it wasn't drugs or alcohol or some, you know, they weren't devil worshipers. That wasn't what kept them from hindering. That's not what hindered the will of God. It was their heart. It, listen, it's your heart. It's my heart. It's our heart that can hinder what God wants to do. They, they, they're here at, at this point and they are surprised that the will of God is going to take some time. They're, they're surprised that the will of God is not going to be easy. They don't like the fact that it's going to be uncomfortable. You know, the, the religious world wants things comfortable. And I'll, I'll, the, one of the reasons why I begin to think about this story and put the, the sermon together because we just celebrated 35 years a couple weeks ago for our harvesters. That's a long time for a church. And you know what happens? The longer a church is here, the longer people are saved, we kind of have to deal with some things. Over time, uh, our desire for the easy life becomes what we want. We want, we want to be, things to be easier. We want life to be safer, comfortable, security. You know, every human being, that's the kind of life they want. They want a secure life, a safe life. They want a, a safety. They want e How many want an easy life? Pastor, I don't want, you all want an easy life. Just be able to chill. No outreach. Just come to church. Some of you are already doing that, amen? But every human heart, there is a desire for the easy life, for comfort and security. 
And this is exactly how it was at the, this critical time with Joshua and Caleb and the spies. We know the story. But human heart, mankind, Luke 12, verse 19, And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. The longer we get saved, the longer we serve God, this becomes something we have to wrestle with. Okay, God, I've done my time. I was here for the early days. I was here. I, oh, I remember the walls. I was, you know, I, I, I love hearing the stories that you guys have about when you built this church. Uh, the wall fell on some of you guys, and Brother Tino almost chopped off his arm. My goodness, you guys had some, you guys did a lot of, it was a lot of work. We have built this church. God has put us in a position. But over time, we begin to get this mindset. Okay, you know what, God? Now I'm just ready to be comfortable. Blessing, reward for my sacrifice. Our story gives us the, the understanding that with longevity brings an entitlement mentality. Okay, God, I am ready for my blessing. Do you know how long I've been saved? Do you know all the things I have done? I have labored. I have done this and that. God, I just want a hammock by the beach and I just want to retire and watch everyone else do all the work. But Caleb, in the story, Caleb shows us this is the wrong attitude to have. Remember, this is the critical time. It's 45 years have passed, and now God is ready to make good in His promises. Here's the promised land. Here's what I'm going to give you, your reward. Caleb's attitude is the attitude we need to have. But we, we're afraid of risk. We're afraid of doing what's necessary. We're afraid of the work. Luke 19, verse 20, we know the parable of the talents. Then another came saying, Master, here is your mina or your talent which I have kept away in a handkerchief. We know the story. How many know the master doesn't want you just to hold on to what you have? That was the, the parable. God, he says, take what he has and give it to the one who has. And it, the, the picture is of a person that's afraid to, to invest, that's afraid to move forward, that's afraid to take a risk. It's afraid to trust God. Over time, the longer, the longer we're saved, we want to get to the place in life where we don't have to trust God for anything. We try to organize our life to remove risk. We want to lower our commitment to easier, more comfortable, and safer lifestyles. Sometimes we don't even realize we're doing this. That's not right. We just, we don't realize this is what we're doing. We just, we, you know, we, we step back and more, I, I want to ask a question. When's the last time you had to trust God for something in your life? Like major. Have you ever put yourself in a position? We know the story of Lot. Genesis 13 10 through 11, him and Abraham are getting ready to part and go their separate ways. Verse 10 of Genesis 13, Lot looked all around and saw the whole Jordan Valley, that there was much water there. It was like the Lord's garden, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose to move east and live in the Jordan Valley. In this way, Abraham and Lot separated. You know, we, we hear a lot about we hear a lot about Lot in the Bible. But you know, I was thinking about this. Lot chose the easy route. Oh, I don't have to do no work. Look, there's plenty of food here. There's water. Plenty of space. I'm going to go over here. This is easier. The path of least resistance. You know what's interesting is you never, never in the Bible do we ever record Lot trusting God for anything. 
I can't be a hundred, I, I did a little bit of research before I make that statement. Nowhere do you find in the Bible where it says, and Lot trusted God or Lot believed God. Lot, was, Lot never lived a life, never is it recorded, where he's asking God for advice. He doesn't, he doesn't even ask God for advice. Doesn't ask God for a miracle. He wants the easier, less challenging, less sacrificial style of life. For Lot, this was the easy choice. Many of us, this, this is the way we live. Especially the longer we're saved. God is obviously moving in our midst. You can feel that God is bringing us to a point. He's ready to divide the land, blessing and increase, deliverance, favor and marriages, our children. I'm praying for our children, the next generation. We're believing God for good things. But many of us, we're, we're not, we don't have the stomach for it. We're afraid to go out on a limb. We're afraid to sacrifice our time. We're afraid to sacrifice our finances. I don't know about you, but if you were here la the last service, I read the report from Raymond Salazar in Watsonville. That's an exciting thing. God is moving in Watsonville. God's moving in Coachella. Our baby churches. You and I went on record for the harvesters. We got their back, right? Okay, hopefully that's coming in the offerings. Amen. They're going to send a lot of money this week for those guys. Oh, pastor, it's a lot of work. There's other people that will do it. Pastor, I, that, I did that. I did my time. I already gave my part. I invested my time. There's a, a danger when we embrace this mindset. Let's look at the consequences. You know what happens when you pull back? When you stop taking risks and you start and start living an easier more mellow less challenging life you know what happens is life becomes unsatisfying when you remove the challenge element out of life life becomes boring you begin to wither away a very sad story I'm, I, I, of my family my my mother's dad my grandpa on my mom's side very, very good man. He helped everybody. He worked for a long time. He was a concrete mason. I might have told the story. I don't know if I did or not. But my grandpa, he, for many years, he worked with concrete. He built big buildings up for the, the laboratories, worked for the government. S strong, hardworking man. He worked for 33 years for this one company, or 36 years. Retired. Retired at 64 years old, 63 years old. When he retired, my grandpa started taking it easy. First, the first year, actually, he did a lot. He was doing a lot of things around the house, staying busy. Then he started going fishing, all the cool things that you do when you're retired. Then he just got bored. He stopped doing anything. Stopped helping people. Doesn't matter when I would go visit my grandparents. We always found my grandfather there smoking his lucky strikes, sitting there watching TV. All day long. My grandfather died at 67 years old. He only retired for like, only lived a four-year retired life. And the doctor said it's because my grandfather, he had no more challenge. He, he, he like, his life was done. He, he, his desire, the challenge, the risk. Brother, sister, God didn't make us to take it easy. Listen to me. We're not made, we're not designed for the easy life. You remove the challenge. You remove the risk from life. You, if you're not willing to take a risk, if you always want to live in safety and security, this removes your purpose, the adventure. Life lived any other way is unsatisfying. When we as people take, take the need to trust God out of life, Life will become unsatisfactory. I don't know if you know, familiar with the name Robert Oppenheimer. My grandfather actually met this guy. Robert Oppenheimer was the man. Him and Albert, Albert Einstein, some other guys helped 
uh, designed the first atomic bomb. That's actually